so Bayo Akomolafe is our next guest um, presenter. And Bayo is a dear friend and a brother who uh, came to send last year for the first time we met last <laughs> October. And he kind of created a, a very, a noise. big ripple effect, I would say, <laughs> in the field with his... Um, with his presence and his open heart. And he shattered, I must say, quite a few uh, ideas and old ways of doing things at our event and our spiritual <laughs> community, for which we are very grateful, Bayo. And um, I feel like you, you kind of took us, something shifted with your, with, with your talk at Sen that opened mm -hmm. something for the community that wasn't possible before. And um, Bayo is from Nigeria and he lives now in Chennai with his beautiful wife and two children. Um, Bayo is a speaker, teacher, academic renegade as he likes to refer to himself and also a Yoruba poet. He's globally recognized for his poetic, unconventional, soul-steering, mind-shattering views on the global crisis and social change. And he's also the um, chief curator of the Emergence Network. And he has a new is, title. Oh. He, has, he has a new title. Bio accepted our invitation to become a member of our board. <laughs> so as Send, as you know, we are a nonprofit organization and Bio is, a, is now a member of, of the board of science and non-duality. And it's such an honor to have you in our family, deeper and deeper ingrained in our community and in our family, brother. Thank you. Thank you Thank for you. being with us today. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be with you over and over again. And I hope we continue to do this till we're pretty old. Uh, so <laughs> thank you for having me. Would you like me to dive into it, guys? Uh, yes. yes, and don't rush. We have a lot of time. So just okay. allow whatever needs okay. to unfold through you. We have plenty of Wonderful. time. For once, <laughs> we are Wonderful. not rushing through what we are doing here. Wonderful. And that's Wonderful. the lesson you gave us. <laughs> <So, yeah. laughs> yes, yeah, one of them. Down. The times are urgent. Let us slow down. Exactly. Yes. <clears throat> um, I greet everyone here and fathers and uncles and aunties and brothers and sisters, Yoruba people. Um, by the way, am I breaking in and out or are you, am I clear? Just for a second, you're good now, just for one second. Okay, yeah. okay. okay. Just so you know, there, there are lots of rains right now in Chennai. So the connection is quite fragile and volatile. Okay, um, so uh, my, my, uh, uh, my apologies. However, I don't want to apologize too much because I hope that the glitch, you know, would disturb <laughs> the things that want to be said. Uh, so I want to give honor to the tricksters and the goddesses of the glitch that interrupt eloquence and invite us to stay with the silence of that which might not want to be said. Okay, so... Um, all of that is also part of it. Thank you for having me, guys. Um, I would just dive in, into it and say, yeah, it's, it's there in my title. Death is always unprecedented. Um, it's always new. Um, I was listening to Ben, uh, that beautiful video from Ben, and it reminded me why I'm here why I accepted this invitation and why I always say yes. Apart from the fact that I, um, I'm now a member of the board of Sand, uh, why I want to be here is because I want to be constantly reminded that death is mysterious. And anytime I want to wrap my head around it um, to reduce it to intellectual concepts, to figure it out in a spiritual moment, um, I want to be defeated over and over again, to be reminded that is happening, um, that disturbs the idea that death is still, that death is a category, you know, a simple event. 
Um, so I, th I, I want to thank Ben for that beautiful video. I'll be checking it out myself. It seems it, it really stirred people. Um, I want to check it out again and again. Um, death played a huge role in the world this year, didn't it? Um, the virus, the pandemic, it was huge. It took away lots of lives and it's still doing its work actually. Um, a couple of days ago, I, I lost my, um, my, my wife, my wife's um, grandmother died. And um, just two days ago, I was at her, at her grave, uh, at the grave site, just being silent among the innumerable bodies buried in that place. Just think, thinking about the ways that we conceive of death and and it and the violence of it. So I want to start out with uh, with a prompt, if you will. Think about how you have been touched. Think about how you have been touched by dying this year um, or death. I like to think of it as a continuity, not as a, a static moment, like I said. So dying instead of death. Think of it as, you know, what has happened to you this year? What, what has touched you this year? Maybe not even personally, but something that has stirred you and troubled you. Uh, a passing of a loved one or a passing of someone you respected. So... Um, just write it down. You can share it in a chat if you don't have paper and pen. But I'll just take two minutes of silence as you do that um, to remember, to remember and not forget those who are still present and those who are here with us in, in ways that are too fine for words, too promiscuous for presence to hold capably. When absence becomes a form of presence itself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing these. So, so we don't lose the immediacy of what we're talking about. Let us have um, this few seconds of silence together and to hold the weight of these passings. Remember that we're part of this, all of us together.
Thank you for sharing. Thank you. And please, you're encouraged to keep on sharing, either digitally or right there with you on a piece of paper. Growing up in Nigeria, um, I grew up in the Christian South of Nigeria. And so I grew up in a paradigm that insisted that death is an enemy. Can you hear me? Oh yeah. Okay. It was okay. a very beautiful pause to take that that line in. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was saying that growing up in Nigeria, I had a, I had a, I was brought up in in the Christian South, and the teachings of that region was that death is an enemy something to be vanquished at the end. And I looked forward to it because death took my father very early. Um, I've written about it in my book. Um, so I dug deep into my Christian faith then to understand and to look forward to a paradigm, a world where death was no longer possible. Death was this empty space, this dark region in space-time that was just waiting to be like a wound in the flesh that was waiting to be stitched up again. And that was all I could think about it. You know, the flaw in the perfect, the otherwise perfect world of creation. But I started to rethink my notion of death as just an empty end, as something that happens at the you see, instead of as something so mysterious that it's just as mysterious as life, maybe we should just as well be asking what is the meaning of death when we contemplate the meaning of life. Let me tell a quick story about um, my people. Um, the Igbo people are very, very strong people, uh, come from Nigeria, the eastern part of Nigeria. Uh, my wife is actually part Igbo, part Indian. Um, in 1803, a slave ship drifted into um, Georgia, the United States. And this slave ship carried on board about 70 Igbo men and women and children from what is now called Nigeria. These men and women were enslaved, were taken from their homeland, and they didn't, of course, have anywhere to go. And they were brought into Georgia. They disembarked at um, St. I forget the name, I think it's Dunbar's Creek. At Dunbar's Creek, they decided, you know what, we're not gonna go without a fight. And so they decided to wrestle their captors and they fought and they beat them up. <laughs> they beat some of their captors and some of them escaped into land and came back with reinforcements. And the reinforcements were able to um, um, push back the slaves into the ship or into near the shore, um, hiding behind the ship where those 70 plus bodies um, after some time, the chief among them, the chief among the Igbo people said to everyone gathered and said, it's the spirit that brought us here. The same spirit will take us back home. Let us not wait for these men to capture us and take us to their plantations. We resist that. And so men, women, and children marched into the waters. And they were, as they were doing so, they sang a song. I do not know the song. I don't know that any one of us knows the song, but they sang, the same spirit will take us back home. Amadioha, the God that brought us here will take us back home. We will fly across the Atlantic back to our homeland. 
And that was the site of the famous Igbo landing, um, the site of a mass suicide um, that took the lives of these 70 plus black bodies from Africa. It's popular today. People talk about the Igbo landing all the time. And they talk about it as if it were a terrible event, <laughs> which is curious to me. Um, because they imagine that these people drowned and died. That is one reality, you see. Um, but according to a certain other reality, they flew. They took on wings and they flew back home. I like that idea that death could be a form of flight. That what is happening when we die isn't exactly just a termination of life. It is a meeting, a keening of the mysterious. That something else is happening there that words are too weak to be able to wrap their concepts around. Death as flight, death as magic. Without romanticizing what happened, what else can we say about dying that is an invitation for us to study around the cracks of dying today, especially when dying is such a powerful, powerful visitor, not just in 2020, but in the Anthropocene. This legacy of death is all around us, not just the death of human bodies, not just the death of black bodies in a time of racial tensions, but the death of environments, the death of fish and polar bears, the death of climate, it's as if the world is calling us to study, to be still, to slow down in these times of urgency. So that's one mass suicide. I want to tell you about another one. And this one is really very interesting, probably just as interesting as the Igbo landing in 1803. And this one happens every day. <laughs> um, it, they even have a name for it. Biologists have a name for it. It's called apoptosis. I'll tell you what apoptosis means in a while. Now, microbes, and this is, this, this, this is something that I would recommend everyone get to study around. I read it about this in a paper called Microbial Suicide. Microbial Suicide. And this is how um, marine algae, marine um, uh, microbes, like the phytoplankton, actually commit suicide they take their own lives. Now you might say that's instinctual, that is probably genetic programming of some sort, uh, maybe some environmental trigger causes them to kill themselves. Um, but it's more mysterious than that. And biologists are finding out how mysterious life is and how mysterious death is um, just by the occasion, just because of this microbial suicide. Um, so the phytoplankton uh, microbial forms. Um, we've had a theory about these cells for a long time um, that is called original immortality. Original immortality. It's the idea that given what we know about cells and microbes, they can continue to exist forever if nothing came in their way if they weren't eaten by other life forms or had some form of accident, they would continue to reproduce forever. They split into different uh, forms and the individual microbe dies, but this dying does not produce corpses, you see. So this reproduction gives birth to other, um, uh, proliferates the community, if you will. And so biologists have always believed that Cells like this, microbes are immortal. They live on forever, um, except you know, in cases of necrosis. Necrosis is when um, an accident occurs. So, um, but with new technology, newer technology, especially in this decade leading up to the 2020s, uh, biologists have started noticing that Cells take delight in dying. <laughs> like there is something called programmed cell death. Um, and don't, don't linger too much in the term program. You know, the word program means pre-written. Um, it's as if 
there is some kind of synchronized dying um, that happens that has disturbed the idea of original immortality. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm seeing the song here teaches about cellular, cellular apoptosis. That is good. I'm no biologist. I'm a recovering psychologist. So I can only speak in limited terms about this. Um, but what's interesting is that as they, as biologists have looked even deeper, you know, into what happens around apoptosis, around this synchronized dying, um, they've had to reevaluate what death means or what death is doing, right? Um, because the famous or most popular idea of death is that it's an adaptation of life. So it's subservient to life. It's, um, um, it's a way for cells to um, sacrifice themselves for the greater good of the cell community, basically. So death has a purpose, right? Life is primary, death is secondary. It has a purpose, it, gives, it helps life proliferate itself, right? But what if cells are doing this, this synchronized dying with no apparent benefit to the community? <laughs> what if there's no reason to do this? Like there isn't a purpose, there isn't some teleological um, notion attached to dying. And there isn't some kind of genetic trigger or environmental trigger. It's as if they're just doing it for the fun of it. Um, I dare say, you know, that these biologists are beginning to find what some indigenous cultures have known all along, that death and life are intertwined with each other. Death is not secondary to life. Life is not primary before death. Death and life are so entangled that maybe we should speak of life death as if it were one word or death life, um, not a thing apart. And this brings me to the idea that um, Maybe our notions of death are so anthropocentric, humanocentric, that we don't, it, we're, we're caught up in the bubble of anthropocentrism, of humanocentrism, that we are cut off from all the other things that death is doing, how it proliferates the world, how death is already happening right now where Maurizio and Zaya are seated. We are giving off millions of cells. We're dying constantly. So that the idea, the, the Christocentric idea that death happens at the end of history or death happens at the end of life is already queered um, by this apparent joy that cells take in dying, you know, in offering themselves, which has no purpose or benefit that is discernible by biologists. So let me speak a bit about this anthropocentric notion that is deeply connected with another idea um, that is liberal humanism. Liberal humanism is the, um, is the notion that we are separate selves. We are rational, separate selves. We are um, uh, distinct, discrete, rational thinkers, separate from the environment. The environment is just the background, um, the stage which, uh, that supports what human beings are doing, right? So liberal humanism presupposes that we have free will. Um, we are immersed in linear sequential time. We are closed systems. Um, so that what Zaya means is always separate from what Maurizio means. Um, and the two shall never meet, even though I don't even think that's possible between you two. <laughs> um, the twain shall never meet. We are always separate, right? Um, and that is liberal humanism. But there is a field of thinking and playing and poetry and dancing with indigenous uh, revivals of um, dusted and um, buried but alive notions of life and death that, I, uh, that is called post-humanism. It's a cultural theory called post-humanism. And post-humanism does not mean after the human, as if we should get rid of human beings. It's a, it's a, it's a way of refusing human centrality in the world, the way of refusing the idea that humans are agentially masters of the universe. 
that we are lords over the realm, transcendent over materi uh, materiality. Um, it's a way of dragging us down to earth, right? Um, um, humiliating us. The word hum uh, humiliating comes from humus, which means earth, right? Which means uh, the ground, soil. So post-humanism is a way of saying, we have not escaped yet, and we probably never will. We are not separate or unique or exceptional. We are part of what the world is doing. We are not on earth. We are the earth in its ongoingness, right? So that even our bodies are, and this is a big word, um, Stacey Alimo is a feminist theorist that came up with this word, uh, transcorporeality, transcorporeality. Um, and that big word, that big sounding academic word, what it means is that our bodies are constantly trafficking with the outside world so that the meaning of the inside and the outside is already disturbed. If you can think of a Mobius strip, a Mobius strip doesn't know where an inside is or an outside. So our bodies are constantly engaged in illegitimate, perverse transactions with the environment. We're constantly exchanging cells so that where the self stops and where the environment begins is always a topic for discussion. The jury is out on that one. I think the jury is dead, in fact, because there will never be a definite answer to where we are you know, in the world. So that the very humanist ideas of locating human bodies within space-time coordinates um, is broken if you will, from a post-humanist perspective. So what does that leave us with? If we are the environment in its becoming, if selves are environmental, if feelings are ecological, if grief is not private but a public affair, um, then who dies? What is dying? Who or what is dying then? If I cannot delink myself from microbial communities, I don't know how many of you know, I'm sure you all do. You guys are wise people. I'm sure you know about gut brains, right? You've heard about gut brains and how our brains right here, our cranial um, capacities do not explain um, how we think. Um, Oh, actually we lost, perform. We lost you by. Oh, you lost me. Yes. For a second, you lost me. Yes. For a second. For a second. Hail, hail to the trickster. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, where was I? Where was I? Where, where uh, did you hear me? The brain explain. The brain cannot ah. explain. Yes. So the so I was saying that the brain doesn't explain. You know how the, there's this neuronal uh, reductionism reductionism in the world today where we try to reduce everything about the personality, everything about what makes Zaya Zaya and Maurizio Maurizio to cranial or neuronal or brain-based activity, chemical stuff. Well, um, even if we're to stretch that open, um, people now speak about the gut brain, that how we think is also, we should look at our guts, you know, our bellies, that right there in our bellies, um, microbes and bacteria are conducting activisms of their own. That you think, for instance, that the reason why, um, and I'm speaking to you, Maurizio and Zaya, that the reason why you came up with living and dying and dying and living as a conference is because you thought about it as an idea and you definitely put it on paper and you call people out. That's a very humanist or human relations based notion of thinking about this. Um, but if we're to stretch that further, Maybe it's a certain bacterial community in your bellies that instigated the desire for you to do this, stretching the notion of the human to impossible lengths and depths. Um, people are finding out in other fields within this large post-human playground that how we think about each other is also based on furniture around us, that we derive our personality from tables and furniture and things that you would never even consider to be part of human being or becoming. 
so that the human isn't discreet. We've never been discreet. We're tentacular, chimeric, monstrous figures. And if we were to actually put our shapes, you know, down on a piece of paper, we would startle all Hollywood executives because we will make them blush because they would never have been able or would never be able to conceive of an extraterrestrial concept in the ways that we now see ourselves. We are alien, we are diasporic. We are not just local, we're diasporic. We're stretched out, we're diffracted. And this is what post-humanism uh, notices. This is what Yoruba indigenous philosophies and cosmologies, among many others, have been noticing and speaking about for a long time. That what the human being is, is, is and should properly be referred to as a human becoming, not a human being. We're becomings. We are rhizomatic. We are mycelial. So back to my question, who dies then? Uh, what dies? Maybe we can start to conceive of dying as an enfoldment of the planet, as some form of inquiry, not as a termination um, of bodies in linear time, because even time is caught up in materialities. Maybe what we should start to think about death as, as, as a doing in the world today is that it's what the world around us is doing. That when we die, we're also conducting inquiry into what life might possibly mean, okay? But I wrote it down because I have some other things that I wanna share with you that I put in a list and I can't quite remember, okay? Um, number one, I think death is impossible. Death is impossible. Death is just like man or nature was an enlightenment product um, made or conceived, contrived in the uh, photographic rooms, red rooms of uh, Western imaginations. Um, I think death is also an enlightenment product in some sense, because what death presupposes is that there is an end point. And I wanna quote French, uh, the French philosopher Deleuze. He says, where we place a point, we should place a line, right? So instead of a point, a line, so that instead of thinking of end points, we're thinking of continuity and discontinuities. In a sense, death as a terminal point is impossible. Um, and how we think about death and how the medical community thinks about death is always contrived. Is, there are always agential cuts we make in the fabric of space-time so that death is intelligible to us, right? Um, so I think death is impossible. Dying then becomes some kind of alliance building work. That if I, for just a moment, disabuse my mind of the notion that my mind is contained or owned by me, you know, and not spread out, not what part of what the world is doing, part of what ordinary things around me are doing, if I disabuse my mind of that, then maybe dying is also how the world gets keener, how the world becomes finer, how life meets itself, experiments with continuity. Like my people will say, um, the obstacle at the end of the road is not where things end. The obstacle is where things become finer, where things shape shift into different forms. So that if you find an obstacle at the end of your path, go towards it, not the smooth road. So I think of dying as alliance building work and enfoldment of the world. Third, my third point is death isn't natural. Death is caught up in our political, ideological, um, religious based notions of it. The way we think about, no, I said death isn't natural, not is a natural. Death isn't natural. Um, it's not natural. Um, again, the, 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 the um, notion of natural as this contained zero state place where we can go to and return to as if it were innocent is disturbed by the words of Donna Haraway when she says, nature is a reiteration or deconstruction of itself. Nature isn't still. I feel death and how we think about it is caught up in 
capitalist structures. It's caught up in um, crystal-centric Cartesian structures, enlightenment structures that presume that our lot in this life is to self-produce, amass a lot of fortune to ourselves, amass visibility, gain more likes on Facebook, and then die, right? And death is just an empty point of departure. But if we notice that death is part of life, that we're constantly dying right now, then we see it as something doing, something more is happening right here. And we will never be able to understand it fully, but that's the point. We are only a part of the web, not the entire story. My fourth point is, I think I've said this, death doesn't happen at the end of life or it's not subservient to life. It is part of life in its ongoingness. Um, my fifth and last point is, um, dying is how we borrow bodies to understand the world. Like I feel that selves cannot be fully contained in, in unitary, like I've said, you know, uh, it's this liberal humanist notion of the self. Zaya self within Zaya body. One body, just like we say, one vote to one person, one body to one self. But what if we're more promiscuous than that? What if we spill out? What if we spill? What if we're processual becomings? What if we're relational entities, not just static entities positioned within static selves or bodies? I would say that dying is how we borrow bodies, that we need bodies to meet the world. Um, and so um, we come into entangling relationships with microbes. And within this betwixting place, this middling ground, we perform experiments into what life might mean. So that dying might be using us, enlisting us to understand itself, right? If you see dying as a murmuration, like a murmuration of starlings, you know, it becomes then um, an invitation, a hospitable invitation for us to notice ourselves and to be part of things we cannot understand. So dying is how we borrow bodies then. So let me end this way with a call for us to die well, to die well. Surprisingly, the word demise means a transference of property a transference of property. And I feel we're in the age of demising. Permit me, I, I'm a second, uh, I wasn't brought up in English, which gives me permission to, to break English the way I want to, you know, for my ends, okay? I can use it in my fugitive, you know, passion to do what I wanted to do without um, paying too much respect to syntax and grammar. Um, I feel that this is the age and the paradigm of demise. The demise of the human colonial object, the subject that has positioned itself so troublingly at the center of the matterings of the world that seeks to perpetuate permanence, you know, the fantasy of permanence and longevity, you know, at the risk of poisoning and toxifying, there you go, all the world around us. And modernity is this performance of permanence. It's why we build skyscrapers with concrete, with no recourse or no consulting the animal and plant life around us. It's how we say that our work is to build more cars and more iPhones. You know? And it's why we're in this mess in the first place. The mess we call the Anthropocene. So I feel that embedded in the activisms of the coronavirus, embedded in the unfurling of the Anthropocene, embedded in the disaffections we feel with nation states and democracy and partisan politics is an invitation for us to learn how to die well, to decenter the human. Again, the dying I'm speaking about is not something that happens at the end of history, at the end of sequential time. I'm inviting us into inquiry, into decorating our transience, into ordaining and celebrating our passing away, our fading away. I'm inviting us into a space, and this is not my invitation, this is the invitation of the crossroads, because we're all in a time of the crossroads. The highway doesn't 
help us anymore, right? The highway that told us we need to get to the future, we need to get down the line, is broken apart. And now we're intercepted, intersected, interrupted by the crossroads. The crossroads is inviting us to slow down, to decorate our transience, to notice how we are all passing away together. It's not for us to save ourselves. Salvation is poverty. Salvation leads us, might lead us to the same kind of dynamics we're used to. I don't want to be saved. I want to run away from the plantation that proliferates the familiar and tells me to hang on to a God that might give me salvation at the end of time. I want to break into other timelines, other temporalities, and play with flora and fauna. I want to learn to speak with my ancestors and play with them and listen to them. Like Ben said in that beautiful poem, to learn to listen. I want to put my head to the ground and pour libations because I think in performing death and dying as inquiry instead of as tragedy, instead of as exclusively tragic, life might mean something different for all of us. Maybe life might blossom in new wisdoms. Maybe life might invite us to do something else with our children, with our elders, and with ourselves. So let me end with that and uh, say what I love to say, that the times are urgent, let us slow down, but the times are urgent, let us die well. Uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> My heart is racing with your words and with... <sighs> Thank you. I, I just want to take a moment actually to take this in. Like it's impossible to anything to take in, but there's something here that just feels profoundly moving at the love. Uh. It's it, oh God. You have this ability to bring words. All of a sudden, I listen to word and da, 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 and all of a sudden, I'm immersed in poetry, which is not only poetry but is philosophy and is and, and it goes inside every cell of my body. You're not talking to my brain, but you're talking to not even only my guts. Are talking. It's so. You, God, you're such a. Mm. Oh my <laughs> you want to fight me? Do you want to fight me, Mauricio? I do. <laughs> Let's take it outside. Let's take it outside, right? <laughs> my God, you're so amazing, man. Oh my God. Mm. <sighs> so, before, I would like to bring uh, and see if there's any uh, feedback or comments from our audience, but I have one question that. I also know, Bio, you talked about you talk about post activism paradigm, yeah. and I wonder, um, you know, as an activist, being part of that paradigm in the past, there was a lot of in me was I was acting out of anger, out of rage, that almost kind of was the no the the mood of the activism movement, and. My question is in post-activism, is there place for grief or <laughs> what is the role of grief in, in, in this place where we might not be able to change anything? You know, we are not fixing, we are not changing, we are not fighting endings. We might be the fifth extinction of species. This is, could be just another cycle. And grieving some of the beauty we've lost or some of the, of the beings of species that have been sustaining and being part of, the, uh, of life for millennia. And talk about grief, something about grief, but also the level of grief that sometimes is unbearable. You know, I, I just have a, a, a dear friend who lost her child, just pff, suddenly shattered, life shattered. That is, unbe that is unbearable. And being with that kind of grief that one soul cannot bear. Yeah. 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 
Thank you, sister. Um, grief is definitely not the work of one soul. And I want to say something about souls, right? Um, that as someone brought up in a Christocentric world, I believe that the soul is the ghost within, right? The ghost that animates the flesh, some kind of ghastly figure that floats within bones and tendons and neurons. Um, and then science came along and said, no, 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 the soul is without, it's not within, it's without, you know, it's outside, it's the observable, empirical, determinable, intelligible laws of the universe. So we shouldn't be so concerned about ghosts within. What you want to do is to look without, not the world without. I feel that, and this is not new, this is ancient, and it's just as fresh, right? I feel that the soul is between, not within or without, it's between. That the world is so utterly relational and processual, like a stream cannot be divided into bits and pieces, that to um, insist that we have essentialized entities dwelling within is to, is to cut up the universe and is a form of violence in itself. So grieving cannot be held by a soul because I don't even know how to speak about souls. Um, but in Africa, especially in my country, in Nigeria, grief is performed as communal. Um, no one cries alone, right? Um, when someone dies in a community, um, you find, as I found when my father died, um, that the tears and the grief of of people around us overwhelmed our own grief. And me as a city trained boy, highly educated, you know, I was angry with that. I felt they're taking a shine. This is not their moment. This is our moment, right? This is my moment, my sister's moment and my mother's moment. Why are they tearing their hair apart and pulling their, uh, tearing their clothes and sh shredding everything? Um, but I later learned why this is the case that grief is an exotic public affair, an invitation to stay with the movingness, the ongoingness, the troubling tensions that imbue, innervate and animate all of life. Um, and I feel that in times, you know, post-activism, when you speak about post-activism, <clears throat> post-activism is um, for me, the kinds of questions that are possible after death you know, to bring it thematically to our discussions about dying and living, that the world enacts dying all the time. And some of these dying events constitute world ending events, like the pandemic we're in right now. It becomes what the French philosopher Miller Sue calls an advent, right? Something so pro profound that we cannot approach the world in a normal way anymore. Right, all of us are social distancing and stuff. You know, normal is dead. Now, the after effects of dying is where post-activism thrives, is where it lives, it's where it breeds. It asks us, now you're an alien world. You're in an alien world. What do you do with this space? Are you still gonna ask the same questions that brought you to your place of dying? Or are you gonna engender new kinds of questions? So instead of trying to, to um, solve your problems, like you know, the way we speak about dismantling whiteness, which we took up a lot of my ac academic life, you know, dismantling whiteness, getting rid of patriarchy. I had a, role, uh, a roll call list of villains that I wanted to dismantle and kill, <laughs> right? I had all my villains in tow. Um, but I feel that there is a place of slowing down, a post-activist, proliferation of responsive uh, responsivities and responsibilities and capabilities that invite us to grieve with each other, for instance, as a form of activism, that invite us to share jealousy, like some people do here in India, to sit around in a circle and share our emotions of jealousy, you know, and say, I'm jealous of this, you see, not as a negative space, but as a way of meeting each other as if for the first time. You see, I feel that post-activism is about touch, touching ourselves and quivering and shuddering in the orgasmic pleasure 
of noticing that we are much more than the incarcerated bubbles of flesh and bones and consumerist appetites that modernity told us we are. So that is what post-activism is to me, an invitation to die well. Are there any questions or comments coming from the community? Does anyone would like to share? Uh, you can raise your hand or place a comment in the chat or question. And I see Vic Victoria, you are uh, unmuted now. Victoria Martino. Yes, thank you, Zaya. Um, Bio, that's just a fabulous talk and um, very thought provoking. I, I wonder, first of all, just a, a slight uh, housekeeping question. Um, if you can share the, um, maybe in the chat or if Lisa could do it for us. Um, she's working tirelessly behind the scenes. The, the names of the two French philosophers that you referenced. But oh, my no. question, that's not my question. That's just the housekeeping part. My question is, um, I was, raised um, here in the United States in the Christocentric culture. And, um, and I, I have a very independent faith, but it is definitely um, rooted in Christianity. And I just wondered if you could speak to, because um, what I, sort of my overall take from Christianity is, um, is the illusion of time itself. So, so when you talked about like, like waiting till we die and then we're saved and waiting for a better world and the par these paradigms, which I also find very disturbing. Um, it, it intrigued me because for me, um, it's, it's the embrace of eternity itself, which is timelessness, which is like now and always and ever, there's no time or space in the reality um, is completely liberating. And, and to me, that's the only way that we can fully embrace life and live it to the fullest. So I just wonder if you could sort of talk about how you see the relationship between eternity and time as we perceive it in our bodies, in our flesh and blood and bones and tendons and everything that you mentioned. Mm. Mm, how we perceive, well, I can definitely speak to time um, as a, um, as a co-enactment, as a, as a choir song of multiple bodies, you see. Um, I, I see things in forms of assemblages. And an assemblage is, is not a new concept, definitely not original to me. Uh, the French philosopher that I quoted earlier uh, conceived us of reality or the real as, as a rhizome, you see, as this complex network of multiple beings. And I think time is secreted from networks. When bodies come together, they create their own temporality. So maybe there is something to be said when Jesus um, told his disciples that when two or three are gathered, there I am with them. It, it's a form of noticing that time is concretized in relationship, not outside of it, you see. So here is where James Hillman, James Hillman is an archetypal psychology, was an archetypal psychology before he passed on a couple of years ago. And he would say that the mind is in the psyche and not the other way around. The psyche is in the mind is what modernity would say. Um, but he would say the mind is in the psyche. The mind is more than just what's here. And I feel that's the same way that we are, we are in time as much as time is in us. We're constantly reweaving time as a crossroads. Modernity is the exclusion of other temporalities. It's the exclusion of other times. So I don't even know how to speak about eternity because I'm fully, well, not fully, not entirely, not in a totalizing way, but I'm mostly conditioned in modern time. The only way I meet time is through clock homogeneous empty time. The only way I relate with duration is in terms of schedules and lists and things to do, you see? But there are magical moments, fugitive moments when some other temporality bursts in. Um, Victoria, I don't know if you can speak to this, um, uh, but has time felt slower in 2020 as a result of the pandemic? 
confusing and sloshy and messy. I don't know if that, you don't need to answer, but if, if it does for, for, if it has for you, then we're together in this boat. We've, we've almost felt as if time is doing something different. It's very confusing. Um, so what I would say is um, about eternity is eternity is still being made. Eternity is always yet to come. The meaning of eternity is still up for grabs. Um, I, I cannot think in the world or about the world in terms of categories that are stable. I'm, my mind constantly deconstructs things. So I want to notice the eternity in dying, you see. I want to notice the eternity in an ant or in a quantum, um, uh, uh, some quanta or quantized entity disappearing. Is there eternity in finitude? Is there eternity in, in a kiss? Or is there eternity in saying good morning to one's daughter? Um, I feel those are the kinds of eternities that I'm really into. <laughs> so um, as much as I can speak to it, I, I don't know if I've answered your question, but I feel um, modernity cuts out or cuts away other kinds of eternities, other kinds of timelines, other ways of conceiving time that I feel that we might begin to experiment with today. Thank you. I feel like the for, for me, the... Um the liberation of eternity comes um, in those moments when we uh, are contemplative. So, so in whatever tradition, um, times of contemplative prayer or meditation or um, anything where we let go of time, we let go of the paradigms that we've been embedded in and we, we sort of release to this liberation. And then to me, death, is in that context, like, um, you know, it was, it was always called a little sleep in the ancient times um, because sleep is like a rehearsal for death. So it's a sense of, of surrender in a beautiful way where, where because time is an illusion, we don't have to fear death because it's part of that continuum, but in, which you spoke to, you spoke right. to the continuum. Right. Well, it's one way of speaking about time. I don't usually use the language of um, that might, you know, be articulated as saying time is an illusion. An illusion speaks about appearances and there, there being some kind of base reality behind that appearance. Um, but, but I would definitely say that time and therefore death is still being made. That, that, that we're, we live in a teenage universe, you see, a teenage <laughs> universe that is still figuring itself out. You know, it's still awkward that to presuppose that we merely move forward in some unilinear direction is to is to perform some kind of colonial imperative. You see, what I tell my daughter all the time is that we're surrounded by dying. We're surrounded by multiple times. And how I illustrate it to her is when sometime in, on our terrace in the morning, I would point at the sun. At least I did it once. I pointed at the sun once and I said, do you know it takes reach us. Um, and she says, what does that mean? I said, in a sense, um, if the sun were to be extinguished, we would not know until eight seconds later. So that in a sense, the sun we see in the sky is already a past reiteration. Is already, we're looking into an ancestor. When we look at the sun and when we say good morning, we're performing a perverse form of time travel. <laughs> and it, it's like, and yet I feel that on the other end, when the, the sun looks at us, it's also looking into the future. So that it's in the morning, it's not just a good morning, it's a perverse morning, it's a promiscuous morning. There are other temporalities that are being worked out just in rising in the morning that do not entirely depend on us being contemplative, which is beautiful work, um, uh, but also is around us in a lot of abundance. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Victoria. Thank, Thank you. Gillian, uh, let's see, you're unmuted now. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Hi, Hi Bio. Thank you so much. And I am finding myself. Hello. Can you hear me? See me? Yes. Great. So, as you're speaking, I'm finding in the moments that you're mentioning the crossroads. I feel a great interest and curiosity spark in me. And so I'm curious if you could please say more about 
the crossroads as destination and how do we slow down and be in the crossroads together like what is what are you seeing as crossing and how do we build relationality together in that in that place mm. that is that is um and it's good to see you again jilly good to see you sister. um that is that sounds like an oxymoron you know crossroads as a destination and let me tell you if you've been walking forward on a single path for a long time and you arrive presently at a crossroads, in a sense, you haven't been walking forward <laughs> because at that moment, forward takes on a new meaning. You know, the crossroads queers unilinearity. It disturbs the idea of time, for instance, flowing from past to present to future because other timelines, you know, cross right there and disturb um, the integrity of passage or the integrity of the self. I speak about the crossroads borrowing from my culture's notion of the crossroads. We call it orita. It's much more poetic than just the English word crossroads. But if I were to attempt uh, some kind of translation, it would be where the three roads meet, right? Where the three roads intersect each other. The crossroads in our conception is not just something outside of us, external to our mattering. The crossroads is everywhere around us. Everything is a crossroads, you see, so that it's not a destination or an originary point. It's everything. We're always in crossroads. The world is complex beyond measure, you see. The, the Yongo people in Australia um, have a form of art that they call Birunyung. And Birunyung is a way of cross-hatching every line so that it takes on a kind of brilliance, a shimmering brilliance. And that art form is a way of noticing that the past is here, the future is here, and the present is much more curdled, is thicker than the way we speak about it, okay? Um, so when I speak about the crossroads, I'm invoking... Um, the cross-dimensionality of what it means to be human. When I speak about the crossroads, I'm saying we are not central to the world. There are other beings that are also trafficking, you know, like in a marketplace. There are tables and microbes and animals and ancestors that are cross-hatching what it means to be real. When I invoke the crossroads, I'm also invoking what I just spoke about earlier, a post-activism, and saying that there are other ways of responding to power and imperialism and oppression that does not reify or reinforce those systems, that there are other ways of meeting the world and that maybe the work of our time is to fall off the highway of responsibility, the highway that says the only way to get to power is to walk down this road. And all our lives we've been driving so fast around down this road, hoping that it dips into justice like Martin Luther King predicted, the moral arc of the universe bends towards justice. And I feel that sometimes justice gets in the way of our transformation. And the invitation of our time is to fall off the highway, become fugitive and learn to play with the world in other ways that the highway may not permit. So that is all what I mean when I speak about the crossroads. It's a place of meeting the world, encountering the world and being encountered by the world. To quote uh, the poet Rilke, you know, it's a place where we're defeated over and over and over again. Defeated over and over and over again. As modern citizens, we're, we're afraid of being defeated. We're afraid of being encountered or being overwhelmed, you see? So that is the humility and the call and the invitation of the crossroads to stay with the queerness of the real and to perform other responsibilities to build wilder coalitions with the world at large. You know, it's not a destination, sister. And at, at the same time, it is a destination. <laughs> it is a destination, depending on how you cut it. It's an originary point, depending on how you cut it. But I want to cut it in a different way that allows different possibilities to thrive. Yeah. Thank you, Gillian. Thank you, Bayo. There is time for one more question and there is one more raised hand. Gary, um, let's see. <laughs> Gary. Hi. Hello there. 
Oh, Hello, my Gary. God. Oh, I thought it was a different Gary. <laughs> oh, okay. Hi. What an extraordinary way of communicating. Oh, my goodness gracious. Um, thank you so much, Bio. What I wanted to say was just something about, you know, as a, as a composer who's created music to help people go into the numinous, to break down in an acceptable way, to allow grief to teach us and allow us and bring us into that humus that you talked about. What I've noticed is that the walls we put together of the linear rational empirical way of communicating, the, the linear rational mind as the only credible way that modern society deems credible, right? And yeah. then has divided the world into entertain music and the arts as either ritual or entertainment. And then the rest is all the big grownups, you know, the mainstream definition of credibility in healthcare and in and in science and in academia, blah, 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 right? So I, as a composer, I have found it really my calling to cross over, to go where angels fear to tread and use music as a tool to break the monopoly of the linear mind so that there's a more holistic experience of body, mind, soul, right? However, it's so embedded that when music comes in, people are so afraid of dissolving into the timelessness. Uh, and the more heart and soul centered, that it becomes pejoratively related to like, oh, isn't that nice? Like it's the doily or the garnish rather than the digestive enzyme that helps us receive what actually happened. It just it gets disregarded. And so we live in this culture that forever condemns the arts as lovely and beautiful, not sand conference, Grant, you I've seen the pro the schedule and it's gorgeous, but how do we, cooperate with the needed dissolution of these walls that have divided us into the credible way to communicate and engage and make change versus putting the arts in something, you know, in this little category that is, you know, a nicety that entertains us rather than makes us who we really are. I'd love you to just, I'd love some advice about how we can accelerate this process so the arts become a full on partner in the dissolution of the mm. invitation that you're talking about. Mm. Gary, thank you. I could write a book just listening to that framing of a question. <laughs> uh, that was beautifully framed and articulated. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Um, however, I don't know. It seems my response might disappoint you. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and, and this is why I say so. Um, I've lived in the world of what do we do about stuff for a long time. I'm not, I'm not that old. I'm in my 30, in my thirties. So I'm, a, um, so I have a lot of experience yet to gain, but I've lived in a particular framing of things that presupposes that it's left to us to accelerate stuff, to lay down the foundation for new stuff yet to happen. Um, you know, as a, and as a, as a citizen of the so-called global South, you know, I've been, as I say most of the time, the passive recipient, the passive recipient of the benevolence from the West. Um, when people walk in and say, we're going to cure this, we're going to give you all laptops, make you guys good and ready for the global, uh, global economy. Um, Living in that world has given me a kind of, dare I say, a oh, bullshit meter. <laughs> so, so that, <laughs> like, like, and it's not, it's not, it's not um, unique to me at all. Most of us share it because when you're on the receiving end of things, you tend to understand the real motivations behind why we, um, most of us, act the ways that we do. But what I'm trying to say in all of this is, this cynicism um, has metamorphosed into an understanding that it's not left to us humans. We kind of frame agency and change and justice, for instance, and the things that you've so beautifully expected to happen as a result of maybe some kind of work or activity, we frame it so tightly around ourselves. You know, what do I need to do? What program or workshop or sequence of sentences do I need to put together to get people to dissolve? Um, 
But I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to reinforce or submit a fugitive notion of music, you know, that maybe music happens without you composing it. That maybe there is, or there are places where music is heard and music is played and it's not by the work of your hands. Maybe there are other activisms afoot and maybe our work, in the words of James Hillman, is to learn to appreciate the music around us. Um, this, this writer called Fred Moulton um, wrote that, where does music actually stop and where does it begin? Does it begin, you know, is, does music begin when the composer takes up the, what's it called, the stick? What's the sticky thing called? Conductor's uh, <laughs> baton, baton. <laughs> baton, okay. Does it start when the baton is taken up? And does it end when the baton is dropped? Or is there a sense in which our expectation for the music that might be created is already a form of music in itself? Mm. And is there a sense in which leaving the, the, the hall, the orchestra hall, you know, and speaking animatedly about what we've just experienced together is itself a form of music? Definitely. I want to escape the, the cotton plantation that proliferates a sense, you know, in which, you know, we situate ourselves as the masters of what to do or what to do next. I want to learn how to notice that the world is already doing this. So I understand this angst, you know, a, a sense that you want things to dissolve. You want people to come out of themselves and experience beyond their rational minds and stuff like that. And I think there are rituals and rites of passages that might allow, rites of passage that might allow us to invite that to happen, but not to guarantee it, to create the spaces where people might meet themselves as if for the first time, you know? Even, even if they don't recognize it, we're constantly being in that space. We're in that space. It may not register to attention, but we're constantly being deconstructed by the world around us. Like I said, we're constantly dying. So maybe our work, it's not to enforce some kind of evangelical, you know, activism <laughs> that makes people understand that this is what's happening to you, or this is the, the, the rational self is dissolving, but to humbly, with modesty, knowing that everything we can do and everything we will do will always be partial, you know, because in an entangled world, nothing shows up fully complete, you know. To, to presuppose that we show up fully complete is to disconnect ourselves from others, you know? So just noticing we show up partially might be an invitation to modesty and humility, to play with each other, to assemble spaces of fugitive learning and fugitive music <laughs> and fugitive experimentation um, <laughs> that might produce partial and modest results, you know? Let's get rid of our fascination with the spectacular that change will come in a burst of light. Maybe we just slow down and play with the ordinary because in my opinion, the ordinary is, the, is what the extraordinary wants to become. Oh, it's beautiful, God. You are amazing. Thank you so much for reframing <laughs> that in a lovely way that was unexpected. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, brother. Oh, thank you, Gary. Thank you, Gary. Thank, thank you, thank you Bayo. Bayo. And, and I'm reminded that there was this story we heard on the radio that, you know, all of nature is like a symphony that is constantly readjusting different species, mm -hmm. different sounds to one another. And yeah, that all the all the in an ambience, in an environment, all the species yeah. have a specific sound that is designed not to, to be on a different oh. frequency than all the others. So each one, each species can hear the, their calls. So they don't try to overpower each other. So there is a space for every range, every sound, every rhythm, every, te every tempo. The conductor is embedded into the, yeah. the In the relationship. Nature. And then, and then uh, human appears. Human appears and how planes and jets actually disrupt that delicate symphony and that causes the... Yeah, completely, the, completely disbalance. And so disarmony. listening, going back to listening to the music that is already here. Yeah. We have lost the, the way to listening. Yeah. Right. Mm. Mm. Thank you, Bayo. Thank you once again for... 
for all that you bring and your beautiful heart and yeah. expanding our minds, stretching and <laughs> dissolving them. <laughs> mm -hmm.